Hello. Thanks for coming to the second part of the, the sessions. Uh, I'm Breno, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, CPU vulnerabilities and how to mitigate those at scale. Uh, this is an area that fascinates me. I've been working with security, low-level performance, and the way I see it's kind of like how to boost your workload and still be secure from a um, harder perspective. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I started working initially with Spectre and Meltdown back in 2018 when like the thing was discovered and there was a lot of hurry in the industry. And for instance, this is a patch that I was fixing Spectre V1. And at that time, it started like in January 2018 and everyone expected that by the end of the year, They'll be fixed, and we are happy again. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, and even today, we have a lot of CPU vulnerabilities. So at least six years down the line, we're still having the same problems. And then I moved jobs. Uh, I got into a different company. And one day, someone came to me and said, hey, my machine is slow. Uh, can you please investigate? And that was a tricky one. Basically, what I found at that time is that during KXEC, the vulnerabilities from the pre previous kernel or the mitigations from the previous kernel was carried over into the second kernel. So the second kernel was like booting and kind of in a weird configuration that it was slowing down everything. So that, that's how I got back into the same uh, type of uh, problems again basically cleaning that. And from that on, I've been working here and there to make, this, uh, to make this a little bit better. Anyway, let me talk about, this is what I'm going to talk. Let me start a timer here. Um, I'll be talking about what is a CPU vulnerability, uh, types of mitigations we have, uh, some challenges, some lessons learned, and where I think we should go, given that we are in this kind of problem space Space for six years and things are not getting better. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, as someone said earlier today, I have a bunch of slides here, but discussion is more important to me. Okay? Uh, so, CPU bugs are super old. So, the first one, I still remember some of those, like floating point instructions or uh, were like returning valid uh, results. At that time, we didn't have CVEs, so it was kind of like no one was trying to explore them. But what happens is, uh, nowadays, we have a bunch of them, and people are able to explore them and create a logo and create a website, and like, it seems like it changed the, the way we look at CPU bugs uh, recently. Uh, so in 2021, we have a few of them. Not many, but a few of them. And 2018, when I started this, it was basically Spectre and Meltdown 2 that we expect that would be fixed by December. But in 2021, we still have those. And right now, I just did a look at the Wikipedia, and those are the ones we have categorized. And some of them are from this year. So the first thing is, this is probably not going away very soon. And the kernel somehow is being treating those as like, as they are going away. That's how it happened with um, Spectre Meltdown, like let's fix it, let's, let's fix it quick. So fixing it quick was the main motivation. And then it started like patching over things over uh, on top of what we had in order to deal with like many of them. Um, if you look at kernel.org documentation, you see a big discrepancy here. Like uh, Wikipedia says, as, as I told you, 42 different vulnerabilities. In the kernel org, you have basically 12, and some of them are not even vulnerabilities, like core scheduling or many other things here that you can somehow work around the vulnerability. So there's a, 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 some, somehow a difference between what is a CVE and what is a vulnerability and how the kernel mitigates it. And one thing is, the, cur the way we mitigate one serves a lot of them. And that caused some confusion, and that's what I'm trying to help here uh, 
with this presentation. Any questions so far? So what is uh, an attack or what is a CPU vulnerability? Basically, you have two things. You have an instruction that is speculate on an address that brings some memory content back to cache. And then you, the attacker can probe that cache and try to figure out what is the value of that memory. So basically a process that doesn't have access to the memory. For instance, let's suppose you have a user space uh, attacker that's trying to read memory, memory, uh, memory address. It's not allowed. But somehow with this attack, it is possible. When I got involved in this, I said, oh, this is impossible. And that was kind of the industry uh, initial reaction. But after you see some demos, like, oh, that's, that's really possible. It's incredibly uh, powerful. And uh, so this is how it works. Basically, you flush an array or a memory, and you retrain uh, the, there are several ways, but basically you retrain the branch prediction to touch a memory that does not belong to you, the CPU tries to execute. Later, you figure out that you do not have permission to access that memory and just gave up. But somehow that memory comes back to the cache, and we're going to talk about that later. And later, you can uh, the attacker can do a, a, um, a probe on that memory or on that array that can figure out what was the content that was loaded speculatively. Okay, so that's, that's the basic configuration. And what I did earlier today, since Paul talked about uh, uh, store buffer, is there is an attack for that. So if you remember that presentation, there is store buffer, which is kind of the memory between L1 and memory. And uh, there's an attack called Zombieland that you can fetch from the memory into store buffer, and somehow you can probe that later and figure it out that what is the content of the memory that was loaded speculatively. So that's basically the mode of attack. And you can do that in several parts of the CPU, and for each of them, there is a name. So there was Zombieland for the Star buffers, there's fallout, there's spectre. Basically, it's how you read microarchitectural data and, and how you probe on top of that in order to get the value from the secret place. So far, so good? Cool. So we have several mitigations for this problem. Uh, we have hardware mitigations, we have software, and we have something that is starting to become more prevalent now, which is kind of workload. So when this problem started, uh, the first thing is you need to upgrade the micro code of your CPU. That was kind of what the industry was saying. An important thing that they didn't say is once you have the micro code upgraded, it's not going to fix the problem by itself. You need to have code running that enables that to mitigate the problem. For instance, there are new CPU modes we are going to see later that somehow Linux needs to enable them in certain parts of the code to make it more secure. So let's talk about hardware mitigations, okay? So there are three, basically. There are more, but I'm going to cover three, the most important ones. So we have IBPB, IBRS, and STBIP, the major three. The first one is a command. It's basically a barrier for prediction. So you, you, Linux calls it when it needs to flush all the, all the predictions that will happen before that point. So very similar to a uh, load barrier, but for prediction. And it's a, it's a MSR that you call, and every time you call it, or every time the kernel calls it, it will flush. Uh, the prediction. And we have a configuration for that called IBBB on entry. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's how it works. Very similar to load barrier. Uh, here's an example in the Linux kernel code. Uh, 
So every time that the scalar is changing uh, a process, it goes up to MS, uh, MSR right, which is just like flushing whatever was predicted from the previous process. The next one is IBRS. That's not a command. That's a CPU mode. So when you enable that, there is the, the, the CPU branch prediction is a little bit more restrict. Okay, it's another MSR, but in this case you set as one or zero. And usually inside the kernel mode, uh, we, it is enabled. So the, the prediction is a little bit more controlled. And uh, initially that, that is that can hurt performance a lot depending on your machine model. And that was the one that I told earlier that if it's carried forward, it is usually enabled during kernel time. So if you are K executing into a new kernel, that one is carried forward and makes the performance very worse. And later, uh, there was an enhanced version, which is what a new CPU uses today is kind of uh, always on mode. So you, you don't need to enable when you enter the kernel and, and disable it when you exit. It's like the most common one in very new machines, okay? Except that it doesn't mitigate all the problems. There is something called RSB, we are going to look at that later, which is, I is a buffer for return address. So when you have like a call and return, that return is also there is a buffer for that around 12 to 16 entries. And that is predicted on the microarchitecture when you have a return from the function. And the last one is another mode. It's called single thread indirect branch prediction, which basically says that I do not want one thread to interfere in the branch prediction in a different thread, which is crazy how it works, but basically, if you are doing something on thread A, on same, on same CPU, two threads, uh, SMT on, uh, on the same core, thread B can interfere on the branch prediction. So at that time, uh, this is a, a mode where you can basically disable that. And that has a lot of performance, as you can see here, that it seems like it's just disabling uh, prediction at all. And disabling prediction is very expensive. So those are the hardware mitigations, top three by four. Let's talk about software mitigations or Linux uh, mitigations. So basically three, uh, user input sanitization, uh, process isolation, and rappelling. So that was my first uh, patch that I sent in 2018. So basically the way it works is uh, this address is coming from user space and user space can control where that is read. So if you mistrain the branch that, and usually there is a if here, if let's say usage index is smaller than five, you take this branch. It's not here. But later, uh, you, you can pass an address here, and the branch prediction will go through the if. Meaning, let's suppose you pass a thousand here. So you are able to bring to cache a uh, filled value like plus a thousand, and then can fetch into uh, L1D cache or uh, load buffer, doesn't matter. And then you can, uh, you know, the attacker can just uh, try to probe that address. The first mitigation basically is like this array index noise speculation, which basically mask the, the, the index into the max size of that array. So they, it kind of block the speculation to go to a thousand. Okay, so it limits that to max usage. The first one, very cheap, like basically just a mask before uh, uh, array the reference. Second one was kernel page table isolation, 
And that happened a while ago where you have the kernel not mapped in user space anymore. That started with Kaiser. I was talking to Vlasimir today and he was the one that backported that to kernel 2.6, but it, at least it helps you to uh, not able to address a memory for new, a kernel memory from user space because it's mapped um, into a different page table. And what the kernel does today is they use the PCI ID to help with that. So that performance is not that bad, but you need to pay every time user space goes to kernel space. I did some benchmark a while ago just trying a uh, very simple syscall. It is still like uh, visible. And the last one, and most common one, is called Rapolin. It is it transform an indirect jump or an indirect call into a return. So basically, and this came from Intel. This is originally a paper from Intel. I'm sorry, it came from Google, but this present this thing here came from Intel. So in this case, we are talking about an indirect jump. An indirect jump is uh, you have a register and you, you want to jump to the content of that register. Basically, what they do here is uh, instead of just calling it, you create this protection here and then you move that to the RSP and then you return from that. So you make a jump into our return, so you don't use the branch prediction anymore. So on microarchitecture, you have something called BHB, branch history uh, buffer, which contains where you are probably jumping to. So in that case, this uh, code avoids touching that and using a um, return. Here is an example that I wrote a while ago. Basically, you have an array of functions, and you are just dereferencing it. And on assembly code, uh, you need to compile uh, with some special uh, uh, compiler argument that creates this indirect thunk and an, an, an register. And that register will be the one that will be uh, uh, jumped into. So you have the address, in this case, on RDX. And when you go here, you have this pause and elephants. An important thing here is that this code that exists here are never executed. So it's basically dead code, which will be a problem later when we're going to discuss. But you, you, it's, it's there, it's a dead code that is there just to trick the branch prediction. Uh, this is what we have in the Linux kernel. Uh, it's enabled by default, and these are the options that need to be passed to the compiler in order to generate uh, this thunk for indirect call or for uh, indirect jump. So far, so good. An interesting thing. So as I say here, uh, now we. The, the CPU is not using the branch predictor anymore. It is using a return. And for return, there is a branch predictor as well called RSB, which stands for return stack buffer. So people will start to explore that as well. So they are able to mean strain the RSB as well. So we, we are not touching the, the target prediction anymore. So now let's try to attack uh, moving the poison address into the uh, return st uh, stack buffer. And that required a new mitigation where they call call depth tracking uh, in the Linux kernel, where you try not to either overflow or underflow that register in order to avoid prediction on Rappolin as well. So those are the major uh, software mitigations. On top of that, if you are a workload owner, you know your code very well, so you can do a few things. For instance, if your code 
is trusted, or if there is no secret on your machine, let's suppose you are like provisioning a host or deprovisioning a host, you don't need to have these mitigations, right? So you can, you can gain some performance by not running them. Or if the trap model does not include any user input, you can think about that as well. Maybe you don't need those. Or for instance, uh, SDIBP is a very expensive mitigation. So if you disable SMT, you probably don't need that as well because that attack mode doesn't apply to you. For instance, you can leverage like core scheduler or isolated CPU or even custom scheduler now with SketchX to avoid paying the price by changing a little bit how you do uh, your workload uh, and, 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 and do not pay the penalty of these mitigations. Or some, in some times, like you have virtual machines and just pay the price at VM exit. One example that is quite common is like you have a virtual machine, you have things running on that, it's SMT disabled, and you just flush everything when you enter the, the, the virtual machine and when you exit. But I don't think that's enough yet. Uh, I think we need to have more options for the users or to power advanced users. And that's where I'm trying to help and that's where I see, I see things going to. Like, yeah, you have those options. The industry is using that a lot, but we still don't have more advanced things. For instance, uh, Andrea earlier today, or yesterday in fact, talked about the lib codec, where you have some initial configuration for the hardware, where you get that from user input. That part seems to be like controlled by user, but later maybe you don't need to. So right now in the state of the Linux kernel, you basically either have a kernel that has everything enabled or, or like part of it disabled, but not per workload or not per C group. And that's where we are, I think the industry needs to, to be going to. I will talk about this later. So a few challenges uh, we have in this area. So the topic is vast. Uh, in a fleet, you have too many machines, too many types of architecture different microcodes, and for every uh, of those, they work different. So you kind of you need to understand what you were doing. Another important thing here is like terminology is not cohesive at all. For instance, uh, remember the return stack buffer that is called RSB on Intel, on AMD is called RAS, on ARM64 is called uh, RAP. And if you look at the Linux kernel, same thing, like you have sometimes RAS, sometimes RSB, and in some cases, like they made up something like return speculation buffer. This is something I fixed a while ago, but like I have never read about this before. So once you try to learn more about it, you see a few things that are challenged that you need to understand uh, in order to make some progress. And kernel terminology is not better as well. So for instance, we have a register on AMD, and this is an interesting one because AMD speculate on non-branch prediction. And they created an MSR, and there is a suppressed branch prediction on non-branch instruction. <laughs> In the Linux kernel, it's called the spectral chicken MSR and chicken bit. And that maps here. Another important thing that we learn is that if you have CPU mitigation equals to none when you compile the kernel, it doesn't mean that your mitigations will be disabled. Well, it was fixed on 6.9, but before that, if you want to have mitigations disabled because you know what you were doing, uh, you need to pass a command line argument. Or if you want to enable IPBP on VM exit, that's how you do it. Or if you want to flush at, so it's kind of a mess how you configure these things. And that's where I think we should improve to make this more, e to make, make it easier for CS admins and workload owners to have a better grasp and understand what they're doing.
And as I, as I told you earlier, uh, there are a lot of binary optimizations. So LPC last week talked about at least two of them. One of the big problems is like the way they reorganize the code, the bad code removal, is this going to affect mitigation? We never know, right? Because it's hard to understand if when you change, for instance, from uh, uh, something that is an indirect jump into a direct call, what is the impact of the mitigation? Because this is completely bad code, at least the Rapolin. And another big problem we see in the fleet is virtualization adds another level of complexity. And let me give you an example. Uh, I have some experience with Firecracker, VMM, that does not pass the proper MSR to uh, the guest. There is a pull request open for them, but what happens is you have a fully mitigated host and you have a VM inside this host, you SSH into it, and you see that it's completely insecure or there are a lot of mitigations uh, disabled and this system is vulnerable because of this MSR not being passed through. And in some cases, you are paying the price twice because of double mitigation. Sometimes you have it on a... Uh, the, 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 you, you might either don't have the problem on your CPU, but you are paying the price of the mitigation. One case that is common is when you are emulating the CPU. That is very common when you are doing live migration, so you want to stay in a CPU version. That might have some vulnerability that you don't have on your whole CPU, or vice versa. You, you, have a, uh, you don't have a vulnerability, thus you are not... Uh, uh, mitigating it, and somehow you, you might have been an insecure uh, uh, environment, either paying the price twice or not uh, fixing the problem. So those are some of the challenges. And these are some lessons that I learned during this time doing this work. At scale, every CPU performance win matters. And for that, there are a lot of things going on, and security is hard to track. Another important thing that happens all the time is kernel upgrades usually bring some churn because of mitigations. So you are moving from kernel X to kernel Y, and somehow your workload is slower now. Is it because of a new mitigation? Is it because memory management changed something? Is it because of a lot of contention? So figuring out that one is, it needs some investigation. Um, we never know, there is a new mitigation now, for instance, we are going to kernel 612, there is a new kernel mitigation there. How much is it going to cost us? We have no clue, right? Because it, this is very workload specific, this is very machine specific as well. And another interesting thing that we learned during this time is not only throughput, for instance, uh, in some cases we have some VR um, workloads running on top of Windows, running on top of Linux that is fully mitigated, of course, because this is user-facing uh, workload. ERBS causes some latency in some instructions. And in that case, we prefer like some software mitigations because it's more constant than uh, hardware mitigation. So it's not only about throughput, like I have this workload, it takes like 5% of performance. That is fine, it makes some instructions because sometimes it disables uh, branch prediction completely and it affects a different uh, thread that causes some latency to spike from time to time. So that is hard. Uh, Finding tuning, your, uh, the mitigations based on your threat model helps a lot. For instance, oh, I don't need uh, this type of mitigation because my threat model does not involve that. So that's something that I see more and more people doing, and I think this will eventually be uh, what the Linux kernel will do. Uh, as I was talking to Arnaldo the other day, like 
Sometimes you are profiling something and you see like some crazy instructions. So this is something I got into prod. I was profiling something else with perf. Oh, we cannot see here. But there is an instruction called ver w, which is a very old instruction, basically checking if you can write, that's the w here, uh, into some code segment. This is being reused now to mitigate some MDS. So you are profiling. Unfortunately, the, code, the color here is not good, but it is 97% of the entries of the entry of the system call is spent on this single instruction. That you look at it, say, I have no clue what this is, because this instruction was reused to flush some buffers, some of some of those buffers during uh, entry uh, of the system call. Anyway, uh, I'd like to share uh, where I think this is going and when I personally think we want to go. So I don't think this is going away soon. Our hope that it would be a one-off fix is not valid anymore in my opinion. And again, this is my view of this problem. Uh, kernel flexibility and cohesiveness. As I told you, like the kernel is not flexible enough and sometimes you, it's hard to mitigate what matters for you, kind of like for the distro perspective, you want everything mitigated, that's fine. But in some specific case, you want to choose and pick. Ideally, you want to choose part of the code to mitigate and the rest you can let it run freely because it, it does not pose any, any uh, security threat. So I think we want to make uh, the kernel a little bit more flexible. And this is what I started doing. So those patches landed into 6.12. Uh, basically, now we have a separate kconfig for every for some of the mitigations that were missing, and there were like a lot of them. So you can enable or disable them individually at compilation time. And also like start to making the code a little bit more cohesive. So it's easier to understand what is a mitigation and what is like just a grappling or SLS. And uh, there was a x86 microconference last Friday uh, in Vienna that people were kind of doing the same thing. For instance, uh, start thinking about mitigations per C group. So this C group doesn't have any mitigation. I think we want to go a little bit further. Like I want to have like better control on that C group, but that's a, a big progress. Uh, or something like mitigations light and paranoid. And David from AMD is trying to create something like, those are kernel arguments. Uh, what type of problems do you want to mitigate based on your, uh, on your trap model? Like user to kernel, guest to guest, what are the problems you want to mitigate? And also some boot config options uh, that will help to pass some of those configurations into the kernel itself so you don't need to deal with command line at runtime. Anyway, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, where I think we should go, uh, I think these mitigations are here to stay. Uh, we probably need to give more users the power to control, at least advanced users. Again, for distros, it's a no-brainer. We want everything enabled because that's very generic. But for more uh, workload-specific people, uh, having more and more uh, knobs to change, the better. So right now we just deal with the kernel. So this kernel has mitigation enable or disable. Basically, it does, doesn't matter what workload you run. It doesn't matter uh, every every process on that kernel will be mitigated or not. Or for some workloads with those patches that I told. Uh, eventually, we are going to start talking about workload and C group. So this C group will not be mitigated or not. But I personally think that where we should go is for code section. For instance, this part of the code is insecure. Let me run with every mitigation enabled. That other part, like I don't care, it just doesn't depend on the users. For that one, uh, you can run freely. So we are far from here, but that's my view onto this problem. Anyway, thank you very much. Question?
Hi, Breno. Thanks for the presentation. So I. I was thinking, like on the like two two slides before, where you mentioned like the C group. Uh, oh yeah, that one, the mitigations per C group. I was actually considering to explore like having mitigations per core and do something at the scheduling level, so that like if you have like trusted code, you you can go in the cores that don't have mitigations. Is it, is it similar to this idea? Like, how would you basically you, you call the mitigation instruction checking if you are like on a, on a mitigated C group or not uh, is that the case yeah that, that that's a good point uh, remember that this is not implemented yet this is still like work in progress and that was part of the discussion we had at the x86 microconference at what level do we want to isolate at CPU at C group the, the, the problem today that I see, I'm not very specialist in this area, is that it's hard for you to isolate a CPU without C groups. So it's kind of the same thing. You kind of you remember the ISO CPU from the past? That kind of that's yeah, complicated I mean, now, you, right? You, you could potentially, you know, check if uh, SMP processor ID equal equal. Uh, I mean, if it is in this subset of CPUs, just just keep the mitigation instruction. In a, in a brutal implementation. Uh, so it won't be that different than having like something in the C group, you resolve the C group, you check if the C group is requires mitigation or not, uh, uh -huh. and then you execute or you skip the mitigation instruction, something like that. But in this case, you but, still have kernel threads on that CPU, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess at the end it would converge pretty much with the same implementation. That's it's my just, view as well. Yeah. And I, I was thinking on a per core basis because, like, for example, in SCADEX it would be really easy to do that if we had a way to say do the mitigation or don't do the mitigation. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, anyway, thanks. Yeah, that, I think that's kind of where I think we will eventually go to. Okay. But we, we still don't have these knobs yet. I hope that eventually we are going to get there. Any other question? David? So for the code sections, uh, one idea that I've had in the past is, could we have different mappings in the kernel? Or for, for, for code sections that we're okay with untrusted code looking at, that's the default mapping. You can trap into that from user space. You can access that. And then if you ever hit, a code section with any kind of secret, then you then you page fault and you do essentially a CR3 switch on x86 that would go into like the trusted section. I mean, other OSs I've I've looked at or heard about that's what they that's what they do. It's kind of nice because it's like extensible. Um, yeah, I mean, is that something we've considered? I'm not sure if I followed. To be honest with you, can you rephrase that in a different way? Yeah. So so like cer certain parts of the kernel are going to be trusted, certain parts aren't, right? And you want to be able to know when you need to do, like you need to bang on whatever MSR has, like the speculation flush or anything like that. I'm so if you had the untrusted part be the default mapping, so you trap into the kernel from user space and you're doing whatever you need to do in this untrusted section, and then if you ever hit a trusted part of code or data or whatever, then you would trap into the kernel with a fault and you would do remappings and map in like the trusted section instead, and you could flush all the pipelines at that point. I, th I was thinking about this in a different way. So you, you mark that part in user space. And if you call kernel space from that code section, you will have these mitigations. Basically, this control is, like you trust the kernel, but you do not trust the input in some parts of your code. Oh, so that, that would be where you were marking. Maybe a system call, maybe, like, it, it's completely unclear. That's my view of the problem. So you set that in this part, for instance, you are receiving something through the network, and that's the part that you don't trust. That part will be security critical, and for that part, you you, you have ever mitigation, but not for, like, system D running on gotcha. your machine. But, but you also need to not trust user space to tell you what it is or isn't okay with, too, right? Like, what if... You don't want user space to say like, oh, you don't have to like do anything with the network because then it could also speculate and read network secrets, right? So, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's something that needs to be cared about as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, everyone.